Hello and welcome to the Writing Momentum Podcast. I'm Christopher Maselli. I am not here with my wife, Gina, today. She is out, but I have in her place a good friend of mine, Henry McLaughlin. <laughs> he was tagged as one to watch by Publishers Weekly. He's an award-winning author who takes his readers on adventures into the hearts and souls of his characters as they battle inner conflicts while seeking to bring restoration and justice into a dark world. And now his writing is uh, pretty great because it explores themes like restoration, reconciliation, redemption. And you may have known him from his Riverbend Saga series, which is a Western series. And his new book, Emily's Trials, has been out just for a little while now. And you can get it on Amazon. How are you doing today, Henry? I'm doing very well today, Chris. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. It's always so good to talk to you. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about research today. I'm going to do some research as I talk to you about research. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. And the, the, the reason I thought you might be good to talk about research is because Emily's Trials, as well as your Riverbend series, are all historical fiction, right? They're Westerns yes. and historical mm -hmm. fiction. So they take place in a whole different time period when neither of us were alive. In Emily's Trials in particular, You've got a female protagonist who's an attorney in Kansas, and she's presiding over criminal trials, which I imagine you had to do research to give the story some kind of grounding. So tell us, how did that happen? What kind of research did you do, or did you feel like you didn't need to do as much? Are, are things the same today as they were back then as far as the law goes? No, the things were not the same back then <laughs> no. as far as the law goes. And it was also a challenge because I needed to ground Emily in a historical setting. Yeah. My Riverbend Saga books, I just set it in the 18, late 1870s. And, but I had made up the towns, made up because it was yeah. all fictional. I, I just mm -hmm. made up the whole story world. Because of what Emily's trial was about, a female attorney, I had to make sure I couldn't put it in Texas because Texas didn't have its first female attorney until after 1900. Wow. It was just like, okay, where can I put it? Where would it be most, where would I be most comfortable? And things like that. So that was the kind of research I wanted to do. I, I settled on Kansas because of, in my research, of when did states start having female attorneys? Kansas got its first female attorney in the early 1880s. And that's, that's a good time frame for me. I'm comfortable with that time frame. Yes. So I just set it then, set it in Kansas. Which meant I had to know Kansas. Yeah, because you just completely changed your setting, right? <laughs> As to where it's going to be. And it's going to be a real place. It's not going to be in my imagination. Mm -hmm. I settled on Abilene, Kansas as the town. I really don't remember why I settled. But I know I didn't want to set it in Dodge City because I would expect Matt Dillon to walk in. To, <laughs> right. But what I did was I took a trip up, up to Abilene and wandered around. They have an old town section and wandered around Abilene just to get a feel for the place and whatnot and met with the Abilene Historical Society mm, and fantastic. talked with the gentleman who was the president of it at the time. This goes back several years. And I was talking to him about the book and he said, okay, that, that sounds really good. And I said, yeah, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a murder involving a cattle drive. And he said, well, you have a problem. I said, we didn't have any cattle drives in 1885. They had moved to Dodge. Oh, wow. <laughs> Abilene's cattle period was like in the late 1870s. I said, well, it was big in Abilene at the time. He said, railroads were using Abilene as a hub. So there was a lot of building, a lot of activity. Mm. So that became my foundational setting. I spent some time at the Kansas State Historical Society looking at how they did trials, how they did murders, not how did they do murders, but how did right. they do hangings and, and executions. Yep. And, stuff. and did they even do executions? And so I got a lot of material there. I'm a big fan of Western, so the Western genre in fiction and mm -hmm. movies. And um, so pretty well grounded in books about how to write Westerns, how to capture the culture, how to capture the dialogue what people wore, what people ate and stuff like that. So that was very helpful. So that was the kind of research I did. I do a class on, uh, on world building. And one of the things I say, if you can we all do it, make a site visit. Yeah, I imagine that would just, things. that had to have just opened up your eyes when you're there. I'm, I'm okay. sure all these ideas start coming in as you see locations or you see mm -hmm. even the buildings, right? Because then you yeah. think, oh, that's going to be in your mind now when you're writing. Yeah. And, and take pictures so you can mm -hmm. say, well, now what did that building really look like? I've got a picture. I can see, if, did it have columns or am I just making that up? That kind of thing. Yeah. So 
do site visits, take pictures, take notes, wander around and talk to people and check in with the local historical society, the state historical society. And depending on how deep you want to go to museums, if you're in Oklahoma, if you're interested in Western history, go to the Cowboy Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. Go to colleges because many times they'll have collections of papers from prominent citizens who were in the area at the time frame of your stories. It, it is nice that there are probably are a lot of artifacts and pictures from that time period that are still available. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're not just completely going off the written word or what people think is around. Because like when you mentioned the train, I thought, okay, so does that mean you had to kind of figure out, well, what, how, how did the trains work in those days around that area? Because you weren't even planning to have a train in the story, right? And now you've right. got, as one of the major uh, reasons yeah. for the first trial. Right. And I have Emily take a train from Abilene to San Antonio, Texas. So how long would that take? Yeah. Especially back then, right? Because it'd be even back different then. now than it was then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was all that kind of stuff that had to get factored into it. Some of it you can do online. But what I stress mm -hmm. with people is Google and Wikipedia are not research. They're the beginning right. of research. They give the you beginning. clues as to where to go next. Yeah, that's good. So, so how about when writing then? Or do you, do you plot everything out because you have all these intricacies? Or do you just start writing from the seat of your pants and say, are you a pantser? And say, okay, I'm just going well, that way. I see you nodding your head. Yes, yeah, so that's the way you do I'm it. I'm a pantser. I'm a pantser, uh, which is something because I also have um, OCD. I can drive myself nuts, but I'm a pantser. I just, I started in my second river book, Riverbend book, where I had an outline. I took six weeks to outline the story, started to write it. And then I realized we're not on the outline anymore. So I said to the characters, I said, come on, we got to get back on the outline. And I don't know if this has ever happened to anybody else, but my characters went on strike. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't do what I told them. They finally said, look, we're telling a better story than you outlined. Hmm. That's when I became a pantser. I just followed them. I think it's Faulkner who said, I create a character and then I pick up a pad and a pencil and I follow him around, writing it down, everything he says and everything he does. That's a pantser. Mm -hmm. Ray Bradbury wrote the same way. He's, they were pantsers. And what I like about pantsing is the freedom it gives me to see what the characters want to do. Yes, yes. You just follow them, explore them. Sometimes I'll stop and say, why did you do that? And hear from them and get more. Because that way I get to know them more as people, not just names on a page. So that's why I enjoy pantsing. And I like it when they take me down a rabbit trail that, oh, wow, I didn't even see that coming. Here we are. It's surprising to you as the author and probably makes it very enjoyable to say, oh, I didn't know that yeah. was coming. And, and here we're going that direction. I always hear you talking about characters because of the way you talk about how they talk to you and you talk to them. In your creative process, you see them as actual people that you're interacting with, don't you? Yeah, I do. I tell a story when I was writing my first book, Journey to Riverbend, and the publisher at the time when it was traditional said, your heroine, her name was Rachel. She's too good to be true. She's the prostitute with a heart of gold. She's just too cliche. So I said, okay. So I started to try and revise her, make her a little, give her some rough edges and stuff. At one point I said, I'm not getting anywhere with this. So I interviewed her. And nice. Did I you do it on paper? Grandma. Did you sit down? I sat down with her. I put her in my grandmother's rocking chair. And I said, I need to talk to her. I need to find out what you're about. She said, this was after like seven drafts of the novel. Yep. And she, I said, Rachel, I don't get it. What do you want? And her response was, you know, women. She said, didn't you read the book? Don't you get it? Didn't you read the book? Uh -huh. And that's what I was missing with Rachel was her spark feisty, independent spirit. And it came out from that little interview came her core values, which were no man is ever going to control me again because she had been yeah. abused for years prior to this book. So that's, I don't know what sent me off on that rabbit trail, but that's how I, yeah, my, I talked to my characters. My wife said to me one day, she said, I'm going to go out with some friends or go shopping or something. She said, you won't mind being alone. She said, you won't be alone. You won't be alone. <laughs> you have all those people in your head. Okay, but when it comes to, now we were talking about research. So when it comes yeah. to doing research and you've got these characters who are going off and doing their own things, how do you make sure then that what you're writing is still authentic, that it hasn't taken you to a different time period or, or, or into something that didn't exist in Kansas in the 1880s, yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah, that's where the research is the foundation 
mm-hmm. or the story world. And the characters can go and do whatever they want, but they have to do it within the confines of the story world. I see. I'm mm-hmm. reminded of a pastor, who, a preacher who once said, in the time of King David, in the time of Jesus, men could fly. They just didn't know the laws of aviation. The laws of aviation we have yeah. now were in effect when Jesus was on the earth, but nobody knew them. Mm-hmm. So it's, okay, guys, this is your story world. Mm-hmm. Men are flying, so you can't fly to San Antonio. You can't, you can't jump in a Lamborghini and speed over to Kansas City or whatever. So that really helps them stay within the story world, too, because mm-hmm. th- that's their world. Yeah, that's good. I, I noticed right off in Emily's Trials, I, I, I knew it was a, a book about uh, this woman who's an attorney, and she's got these trials coming up, and I knew there was going to be a murder and all that sort of thing. I was struck by how right in the first chapter, just the first few pages, there is mm-hmm. a very clear love triangle created, <laughs> right? And suddenly I realized, oh, you're building in like these foundations in the middle of kind of what's a surprising start, right? It, it starts right off with the yeah. first twist. You're building a love triangle. And and that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's in a certain time period or that it's even a woman who's an attorney. It's just, that's basic human connection. So right. uh, w- what was your thought between b- about having that in the story so early? My thought, being a pantser, my thought was, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it surprised you, huh? It surprised me. You're romantic and, at uh, heart is what it is, Henry. I guess I am. And the, the two gentlemen in the opening scene, yeah, I didn't, that just, that's my characters revealing stuff to me as we move along. Mm. As we go along, and there's even an interesting little twist with one of those gentlemen, but I don't want to reveal it because I don't want to do a spoiler. Anyway. Yes, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah that, that was just, as I'm writing along, I said, oh, oh, oh okay, and I'm just writing. And then when I read it the next day, I said, oh, that's interesting. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> well, let's see where that goes. Yeah. I always find, I love writing romantic scenes that aren't always on the surface romantic, right? There's subtleties going on. Because a lot of times for me, they've happened in in books for middle graders. So you can't get real deep in a book for middle graders with that stuff. But still those subtleties, to me, it brings so much life to a scene. And that's what I saw when I was reading that was, okay, wow, we're already seeing things happen that are, there's all this subtext to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think one of the benefits for me about pantsing is I don't think about, gee, I need to build some subtext here, or I need to do this here. I just like the characters. I don't sweat that stuff, and I discover I've done it later on. I thoroughly uh, respect the fact that you can be a pantser like that and do that. I am very much, you talk about being OCD with stuff, like I have to plot every single scene, every single point of every single scene. But Mm -hmm. truthfully, most of that plotting that I do is probably the kind of things that you do when you're writing. I'm still listening to the characters. I'm still yeah. seeing how it all goes. I just haven't written everything out yet. And I'm just getting all those little details as I go. But I have mad respect for someone who can do the pantsing thing. Because I, I think that would be difficult. Sometimes I find I have to just stop. Mm-hmm. And I do what I call a free write. Where mm-hmm. I'll just write a page. What's going to happen next? What, or what? Just work it out in my head. Yes. And. When I start a new chapter or a new scene, I, my question is, what happens in this chapter? What happens in this scene? And how does it connect to the rest of the story? Yeah, so you still got That's a bit of a roadmap. You're just yeah. not yeah. tied down to it it's totally, right? If right. characters go a different direction, you go a different direction. Exactly. Yeah. So we just rip up that map and start over. That road doesn't go there anymore. So, okay. Yes, that's good. Do you have any specific advice you can leave us with for the author who wants to write fiction tied to a specific time period? I think I know what you're going to say based on what you've already said, but what advice Um, would you give? First, I want to give them some not advice. How many times have we heard, write what you know, flip it, know what you write? That's good. Because if I wrote what I know, we wouldn't be here today. You and I would not be having this school. But if I know what I write, then I have to go find out, have to go learn stuff. Be afraid to learn. Don't be afraid to, you don't need to rush it. In fact, don't mm-hmm. rush your writing. That would be my advice. Let the story, as a pantser, let the story tell you what the story is. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, research. Even if you're writing a contemporary story, research it. Mm-hmm. I have another novel that's not published yet. When I started writing it in 2009, so I said it in 2009, or 14 right. years later, just the tech is so right. different. 
but I've kept the story anchored in 2009. And sometimes beta readers have said, wait, you, your character has a flip phone. Then I had to remember what the time period was. Yes. I found that it, technology is the thing that always trips up the uh, my books the most on a later read. Uh, I'll, I'll write a book. It's it's great. And then five years pass, I read again. And I'm like, wow, all the technology has changed because <laughs> it's modern yeah. day. And technology has just changed everything it changes so every quickly. Day, you know, it wasn't too long ago. We couldn't do what we're doing now. That's you right. Having yeah. a convert doing an interview like this. Know what you write from your heart. Sit down and write. I think it was a combination of Elmore Leonard and James Scott Bell said. It was like, write every day and then fix what you write. So many people just, yeah. there, it's done. But no, it's, it's just garbage. Don't be afraid to go back and rewrite. There's a technique I use where I'll write Monday through Friday. Saturday, I'll do a deep edit of everything I wrote Monday through Friday. So by the time the book's finished, I've actually completed two drafts. Yes. Wow, that's um, good. That's helpful for me. Mm -hmm. James Scott Bell talks about setting a word limit. My word limit is 500 creative words a day, 500 words mm -hmm. of fiction a day yes that's it's really sometimes i'll and i usually set a timer for an hour mm -hmm. but one time i was writing emily's trials i went into the courtroom scene just writing writing and i wrote for an hour 15 minutes or something like that and when yes. i looked up i had done over a thousand words wow in an hour because it was just your fingers were on fire scene, it, yeah it was yeah. into the story into the uh, testimony taking testimonies course examinations all that stuff just that was all written in an hour and 15 minutes, that whole course. Amazing. Just Amazing. A little bit of tightening up, but anyway. All right. Where can they get Emily's trials if, if someone wants to first sit and read about her trials in and out of the courtroom? Okay. They can get it at Amazon, both mm -hmm. print and ebook. If they want to go, and I would appreciate it if they would go to their local bookstore and say, I want to purchase Emily's trials. And if they don't have it, ask them to order it. Because they yes. won't, they usually will not order just one. They may order four, three or four or five, and that's going to build sales. Mm, so, that's good. And it's not so much building sales to make money. It's building sales to get the story out. Because I really believe Emily's Trials is a story of hope and reconciliation. People need that story, those mm. kind of stories in today's world. I totally agree. Thank you for writing it, Henry. And thank you so much mm. for joining us here on the podcast. My pleasure. Really enjoyed and, uh, it. We will have in the show notes, we will have a direct link to that book on Amazon. If you just can't wait to get to your local bookstore, otherwise, yeah, head down to your local bookstore and ask them for it. And that'll help uh, Henry get the word out and get hope out in the process yeah. too. Hey, if, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, subscribe, and share it with someone who's interested in doing research for their historical fiction. And I think they may pick up some really good tips. I've really enjoyed this, Henry. It's always good having you on. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure being on with you, Chris. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. And together, remember, we have writing momentum. Bye-bye.